Good afternoon and welcome to Table Talk with Brenda Perryman. And I'm Brenda Perryman. And today I, we have a guest co-host who's going to introduce himself in just a minute. But we will start by introducing our co-host, starting to my left. I'm Robert Thomas, Vice Chairman of the Board of Zoning Appeals for the City of Detroit. Chris Summerall, uh, serving as citizen for the City of Detroit. And I'm Don Lang, IT Project Manager for Ford Motor Company. Welcome, Don. Uh, you're here to stir the pot, so make sure we can hear you in that microphone. Bring it up a little closer to you, and we're, gonna, we're getting ready to go because we have a lot to talk about. But first is, as our tradition, we're going to talk about on this day in African American life in Detroit. And on this day in 1968, Michigan Chronicle columnist, nightclub impresario, and local dance instructor, Joseph Ziggy Johnson, joins the ancestors. He's just 54 years old. Johnson was master of ceremonies at the famed Flame Show Bar in Paradise Alley, Valley, excuse me, Paradise Valley, and had been MC at the 20 Grand at the time of his death. I remember getting to see him one time, and that's when I sneaked into the 20 Grand with fake ID in my hand. And also on this day, in 1988, Isaiah Thomas of the Detroit Pistons starts a point guard in today's National Basketball Association All-Star Game. The mid-season classic is held in Chicago, which we all know, or many of us know, was Isaiah Thomas's hometown. Those were the glory days of the Pistons. Gee, I miss them. Anyway, we're going to start today. We have some controversial topics for you today, everybody, and everybody's going to chime in, but we're going to first start with an international topic, and that is today starts the Winter Olympics. Who's interested? Who's watching it? Who's going to be glued to the TV? It, it depends on what sports is on there. I'm, I'm, I'm not very much interested at all, though, just to tell you the truth. I, I think historically... Uh, the Winter Olympics aren't necessarily what I've been drawn to. Yeah. I, I, I didn't participate in any of those activities coming up. And so uh, so if, if it's on, I'll, I'll watch it. But I'm not going to uh, set my uh, DVR to catch it. You know, if they do have the Jamaican bobsledders, I may look at it. Okay. Don? Well, I'd have to say no. Uh, I probably won't be watching it, at least at this point in time. There just aren't any compelling stories uh, in this Winter Olympics. Usually there's uh, an athlete, like maybe a first-time black figure skater or uh, something going on with the hockey team. But this year, nothing. It seems like most of the uh, value who has been around the comfort of the athletes in Sochi itself. And the security, right? Yeah, and the security. Yeah. That's true. Well, they do have some girls from the track team, uh, some black people on the bobsledding team, I think. It's some, some team. Yeah, I think that what you were referring to, there was an Olympian who she failed to medal in track and she crossed oh, over. Oh, you're talking about, what's her, sled, what's her name? What's her name, her right name? Don? I'm, I know you oh, know her. Yeah, she, I, she crossed I, over and so she's. Lolo Lo, Lo Jones. Yeah. yeah. So I think she's going to be. Have an, she's going to have an opportunity to go to actually get a uh, medal um, in a sport that she didn't come up or have any idea that she would compete on that level with. Yeah, maybe so. I like Lolo though. Lo. What, what sport is it? It's, I think it's bobsled. Bobsled team. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. Lolo Jones. I mean, she she's fine. Well, she, she doesn't give fine. up. She reminds me of a, a candidate who's <laughs> in the race for 14th district who has run for a lot of different things. <laughs> but I'm not going to get into that. Let's go on to the national stories. Rob? Um, national story, Michael Dunn, I'm pretty sure you all heard about this topic uh, in Florida when Michael Dunn was fatally wounded and shot uh, while in a car as a uh, middle-aged to late Age white male asked him to cut down uh, the, the actual radio in his car and was shot. Yeah, I, I think he shot the 17-year-old. Yeah, he, yeah. Shot, he shot Jordan Davis. I think that this again is a black eye 
um, or on the national stage as far as um, perceived race relations because that's the first thing that comes up when you have a, a, a white gentleman and then you have a loss of a life of another young black man or, or, or boy at that time, he's 17 years old. Um, we're all just, we're eagerly anticipating this trial. Um, we, you know, the big picture again is that there's another lo loss of life um, and we can't help but yearn for justice, but I think that there's more of a compound effect, you know, and this, this verdict will be looking for justice in more than just this instance. We, there, there even may be a little bit of um, peace of mind that we get if things go the way uh, that we anticipate them going, a, a guilty verdict based on the information we have now, because we're still uncomfortable with what happened to Trayvon Martin just a few short months ago in that same state. Well, you know, the world has to wonder, is it open season on young black men in Florida, uh, in this country, but in particular Florida, behind uh, uh, what happened to Trayvon Martin and now with, with this young man. Um, my understanding is the same prosecutor is going to be prosecuting same this prosecutor. case. Unbelievable. Yes, it is. Uh, so you have to wonder what's going through that, that person's mind, uh, what's going through the mind of the people in Florida. And you almost get a sense that... Uh, um, he, this the prosecutor better win this case or else uh, that that's how it's beginning to play in the media uh, and to be honest that's kind of how I feel uh, they're comparing the two cases they'll debate the similarities over the course of the next uh, few months during the trial but uh, this looks like a, a, a slam dunk as we spoke of earlier but I hesitate to use that term because we thought that the Trayvon Martin's ca case was going to be a slam dunk and Quite frankly, it's it's similar to the Trayvon Martin case, and but this case is it has more compelling evidence. Well, it has witnesses. Yeah, yeah, uh, a whole lot more witnesses and so, video. Yeah, and yeah. video. There was some video because the um, the uh, officer mentioned that he saw on the tape that they did not leave in the in the video. I believe reading that that the tape uh, showed that. The young men did not leave the parking lot, um, which contradicted the story of uh, Michael Dunn. And so I, I'm not sure what all the video captured, but there's some type of um, surveillance video or security video that will accompany whatever testimony. Yeah. Well, the video uh, coupled with the investigation has shown that uh, there's parts of the story that just doesn't jive. I mean, yeah. uh, for instance, he said that the, the kids left and came back, the video showed that the kids didn't leave the parking lot. He said that the kids stuck a shotgun out the window. Uh, the police said they found no weapon. Then he says, well, maybe when they drove off, they ditched the weapon. The police said they never left. So there are holes in his story right off the bat, and it's going to be interesting how the prosecution uh, uh, plays with that. This story, it rings home with, with me. Uh, when I was maybe about 23, I was mentoring some my younger cousin and some other younger folks they were about 15 and they got into an incident where they start playing certain video games i think they were influenced by them well they did something silly and um they stole a car and uh they uh, fired a shot in the air well at the time all of them the oldest one was 15 um and they received uh the the top was 10 years for and, and there was no loss of life. There was any so I'm interested to see how Where did that take place? That was here in Detroit. Oh. That was here in Detroit. And so um, I'm interested to see if justice is truly blind. Um, because this this the, the details of this account are much more horrendous. Uh, anytime you have a loss of life, let alone a child, um, you know, the stakes only get higher. So I'm interested to see not will there just be a guilty verdict, but how severe, um, what will be the actual, um, you know, final um, sentence that um, Michael Dunn will receive? Because we're not just looking for a guilty verdict, we're looking for justice. And to, to, to get a, a guilty verdict on some type of charge, but not the, um, you know, um, sentence to match, yeah. we would still feel slighted, I think everybody could have. Yeah. You, well, you got to wonder if the Justice Department is going to be uh, watching this case because it looks like uh, there could, could be a possibility of civil right infringement. 
Um, again, I don't know the direction that the case is going to go in, but when this is happening over and over again uh, in a particular state, and the state doesn't do anything about it, maybe it's time for the U.S. government to step in. And, and that's one of the reasons why I'm saying that the prosecutor is going to come in there, and I believe they're going to come down hard on this person, um, like they should. Yeah. They're going to actually do their job. Unlike the, the Trayvon Martin case, they have to show some strength here. There's it's too many race type of issues coming up in Florida. Too soon. I mean, and it's the, the, you're right. The Department of Justice will have to step in sooner or later once these you know these cases keep coming up. And, the way they are, at the rate they are anyway. Well, the jury seems to be more diverse. They chose 16 people, 12 jurors, and four alternates. They have 10 white jurors, three black, one Asian, one Indian, and one Hispanic. So hopefully the pool is more diverse when they come down to those 12. And the jury was seated yesterday, so the trial should start, so I'm going to be taking a look at it as much as I can. I always put, when we see things like this, I always, you know, having a son, knowing young men, I just always put myself in the place of their parents or whatever. The sadness connected with that, it's like they have a target on their back. It's like their life isn't valued. Yeah. It, 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 I totally agree with that. It's as if it's a less value. And it's, it's, it's come to where it doesn't surprise us to hear these stories. It's, it's no longer shocking. Um, I think that what we wait on is not to hear these stories, but we wait to hear the verdict. And uh, depending on how the verdict goes in this, will we become numb to um, you know, verdicts that don't reflect justice? Right. You know. Good point. A uh, good, good point. But you all, you know, you said that the three of you in a car playing loud music might have not gotten that same reaction. And probably not. Not the way we're dressed anyway. And, and, I, and I think that, too, um, aside of attire, there may be some underlying um, disrespect or lack of respect for young black men in general coming from um, maybe uh, mature white males in the South. What do you think about that, John? Don? Uh, well, not just young uh, black males, black males, period, in the South. I agree. Uh, I, that's what I was going to say. And that it's overt down South and a little more subvert uh, up here in the North. But I think there's a disrespect uh, uh, towards black men in our society still today. Period. Mm -hmm. Period. Uh, I know we'll get into r race relations a little later on, but uh, this is, and th this isn't new. This is a story that has been going on since America has been a country. You can flip through the history books, through the uh, newspapers in most of the countries, especially down south, and you'll find this story happening over and over yeah. uh, again and again. And there are going to be several themes coming from this. One, uh, is, is justice truly blind? How can a black woman fire a, a warning shot and she's not al allowed to use the stand your ground? And then you have two white males that are uh, killing people and they're able to, to try and use that as a defense. Uh, that's one theme. Another one is, how are we outraged by uh, whites killing blacks down south when we're killing ourselves in, in the inner cities in the north that's and a, south? That's, a whole, that's another thing. Yeah, so. Where are the civil rights leaders when it comes to that? Exactly. I mean, I, I'm going to be honest with you. We could go, that could be a whole show. But let's go on to some other topics that we decided to stir the pot with everybody. And Rob is going to start this first one. And this one has been on the mind of a lot of people this week. Yes. Um, the question. Okay, Rob. Okay. I believe this was, was it Tuesday? The, the city council voted on the land transfer from the city to the, um, uh, was it Olympia Foundation? Entertainment. Entertainment. Well, anyways, Illich's group, and they, they did the land transfer for consideration of uh, $1. So it's 42 acres, of, was it 42 blocks of land they, they have now, just for a dollar. And How does that work? Somebody explain that. How does that work? I, I'm trying to understand it. Does anyone know? Well, I, the, the deal is it's been vacant for years. I mean, probably over a decade now. That land's nothing's been there, so it's been barren, and they've been trying to do something with it. And this is probably one of the greatest projects that came. One of the, one of the things that fascinated me when I went into um, the the auditorium 
to see them cast this vote, well, they'd make this decision anyway. Illich had brought busloads of people to fill out the auditorium. Uh, it was standing room only. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. But yeah, they voted on it, and it was, I think, I believe it was, six, it was a vote of 63. Um, and they said that the only thing, they're supposed to hire 51% Detroiters. Will they? I don't know. Well, Who's going to keep up? A, a part of that is the fact that I don't believe the agreement was in place when they, they made the vote. So that was part of the reason that um, Councilman Tate had some heartburn over it. It's like, you know, this agreement is not, there's no guarantee you guys are actually going to go through with this agreement. So what do you think of that, Rob? Well, I, I, I think since the city of Detroit itself gave 200, over $250 million to the project, then I believe citizens should be benefiting in the, in the format of having well, some type of jobs. Well, do you think it was fair? Good? No, I don't. I don't think it's fair at all. Okay, yeah, what yeah. about you, Chris? I don't think it's fair, and I think that many of us know that uh, even the construction jobs that are promised contractually, um, these companies, they come and set up shop in the city, and they're not really Detroit-based companies. Um, you know, I worked out of a local um, with a trade, and we would see it. Um, they would bring in a certain amount of uh, city residents and to meet a quota. And then there would be other folks who are allegedly city residents or companies that are allegedly Detroit based. And they've got, you know, the same dummy addresses that, you know, we've heard about with individuals, um, whether it be police officers, firefighters, they have these dummy addresses. And I think, I think to, to tie that as, as a way to balance out the contract when you have such a lopsided benefit factor, I think that it's, it's kind of just, it's, it's, a, it's a sham, um, but at the same time, it's bringing something positive to an area right now that's dilapidated. The current market value is, 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 is way more than a dollar, um, you know, but um, this is a, just another story of individuals with influence and wealth you know, getting things for uh, free. What about you, Don? What do you think of this? Well, I'm conflicted uh, in that I want to see Detroiters get a piece of the pie uh, of this development. But having said that, I think this is where I'm going to start a pot and ask, how is it unfair? Uh, you're talking about a plot of land that's been uh, dilapidated and empty for the most part, except for small pockets or the individual businesses uh, within that area that may have uh, been successful. But as a whole, that, that area was run down and has been for decades. Uh, um, and someone has decided to go in to, to make something of that, that it was available for anyone to take for 40 years. I, Absolutely. I, well, no, I disagree. I, agree. I, I disagree. I think that that land was earmarked, and if someone else was to go in, they weren't going to sell that land to anyone but Illich. And yeah, that's how do you know? That's well, I, I think that, you know? I think that for, for a while, we've all known that that's where the stadium is going to go, and so maybe it was a surprise thing. We probably have known that for the last couple you know, of years. Three, four, let's say even five years. But what about the 40 years that it's been and, in but, that? But, and, and I understand that. But, you know, me stirring the pot, there's a lot of synergy down there in Midtown and downtown in that area in between. And I think that, you know, I, I just think that a re there's a reason why um, other folks would have came and invested in, in, the, in that area right now. Well, they right did. Right now. But they didn't. Here's the thing. You're talking about a lot of synergy down in Midtown, but it's artists, it's this, it's that. It's business uh, but, professionals. But, but do they have the money? Do they have the money? They should have bid on it. They should have tried. At least if they would have tried, we would have known about it. I just don't think it, just because all this synergy, so-called synergy. It's not so-called. It's, it's not so-called. You got to go I down there and I say it's so-called, the synergy you're I, talking I, about, because I don't think it's financial. I don't think it's, they don't, they don't have that kind of money. Yeah, but all in all, it's, the project is essential to Detroit's comeback. It is. Over, over the next couple of years to the next couple of decades. It, it's, it's, it's essential to it. They need a big project like this. I don't like the project only because that community agreement, I don't believe, was in place at the time, and he doesn't have to abide by that agreement. And, and, and that's I, the part that gives me a little heartburn. I don't, I don't, and I believe all the, the city councilmen also agreed that hey, we need something like this, but not you know, you're not about to take you know two hundred, three hundred million dollars from the citizens and not give anything back. 
we need something, you know, in, in agreement. Uh, I, I may have misunderstood, but I thought that the uh, city council agreed on all points except for that one and wouldn't sign off on it towards the end of last year. And they came up with some kind of agreement, uh, at, at least in principle this week, which will allow them to move forward. The, I don't believe everything was finalized with the agreement, though. Okay. And that was the part that people was like, hold on, you know, this is not, we need some, some more back and forth. But they needed to vote. And anyway, or would have just overridden them anyway. So <laughs> it, it, it wouldn't even matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Over over Written. Yeah, over it. Yeah. Um, okay. I think that as far as this is concerned, I think a, a dollar is just insulting. That I guess that's my whole thing. I think it, it'll be good for the city. I differ with Chris on on what he was saying about, I mean, it's that Johnny come lately attitude. It's that attitude when somebody buys, just like Dan, Don, Dan, Illich, uh, Dan Gilbert has bought up a lot of buildings and stuff, and people are talking about him. How dare he come? Those buildings have been vacant for a long time. So to sit up and say, yeah, well, somebody else could have done it. Somebody else well, didn't I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying that either. What, what are I'm you saying, saying? What, what we, well, the point that was made was that basically that there's no other interest in that area outside of Mr. Illich, and I just don't believe that currently. I'm not speaking with regard to 20 years ago, 30 years ago. I'm talking about today. And so That's I think, what I'm and, talking and, and, about but I, but, today. I also, but I also think that over the last maybe five years or so, there's been a concentrated effort to shield that area and pretty much save it for Mr. Illich. Uh, I want to say that. It's, it's kind of hard. The city owned the property. So you have to acquire the property from the city and the uh, Detroit Ac Economic Growth Council Corporation. And that's how you're going to, and it's worth, yeah, it's worth millions of dollars, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, it's impossible for anybody to go in there just to grab the land and say, hey, I'm going to sit on it. So you don't, you don't think that there was any type of earmarking or, or understanding that uh, this is where Olympia Entertainment is eyeing, and so... I, might have been. I ain't, yeah, but nothing's in concrete unless the money uh, Of course, there. because that would be illegal. But, um, but Chris, when I'm talking to you about today, I'm talking to you about today is two years. I get two years can be today. I'm not talking 30 years ago, you know, in my back in the so, day. Time. But, so that's that's my point exactly is that well, 20 time. years ago, no one wanted that land. No, well, yeah. the question on the table is, was it fair? And uh, my response to that is, what is fair when it comes to business, especially business of that is magnitude? Is market value fair? Yeah, mar market value yeah. is fair, but is do you always get market value in business dealings? Well, you don't. And you consider each individual business deal uh, isolated. But, I mean, I'm sitting to the left of a gentleman who can attest to um, the supply and demand for um, real estate in that area and being short supply as far as availability and, 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 and projects and things like that. So I'm thinking that Mark, and, and market value in Detroit is still relatively cheap. And so it's not like you're asking New York uh, or, or Miami Beach market value. You're asking just Detroit market value. I, I, want you, I want to also remind you that we're living in a, a structured, a, a structure, a restructuring bankruptcy Detroit. You have to move these projects fast. And with this Illich exactly. project, it's going to move fast. Everyone else is coming on board. I see projects being approved, but it's you know it's going to take them a couple of years to get this off their foot, off their feet. It's going to take them a couple of years to gather all the money they need to actually lift this project off. With Illich, he's already got state funds. He's going to have city funds, and he's bringing some of his money to the to the table. It's going to move fast. I, I would have liked to seen some 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 minority ownership, whether it be a small percentage, um, uh, offered. In the, in the deal? You had to wait for another project to come about. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll offer this question. If uh, Mike Illich were black, would you still have a problem with it? Hmm. If Mike Illich were black, would I still? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I think that um, you we can agree to disagree on that because, uh, honestly, Chris, I just don't understand what you're talking, you were talking about in that regard. I, 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 you know, I want to move away from this question. I, I just want to say one more thing, because I was there when they, they actually made a decision on it. When Illich brought in these busloads of folks, it, it wasn't folks that looked like you and I. And one of my questions was, now, will these people finally move back to the city? Um, it was, I mean, it was 
I've never seen as many people in uh, the Irma Henderson Auditorium, but they were all for the project, but they don't live here. They're, they weren't Detroiters. They were voicing their opinions. And not Absolutely. Here. I mean, it to me, it, well, it'll be people who come in for the games, enjoy the, this, and then go back out. A lot of people will because regardless, um, you could build it. It could be beautiful. Yeah, you build it, and they will come. But if the school system is whack, they are not going to raise families here. If there's a lack of safety in neighborhoods, they're not going to bring their family here. There's so much, so many other variables. Uh, so, yes, I think that's a topic for later yeah, on. But yeah. okay, golly, yes. All right, Don. Well, the next topic that we're bringing to the table uh, is one which asks the question: Has the black church failed the communities? Uh, and since I'm starting that one off, I have to ask that with a resounding yes, in my opinion. Uh, reason being, you take a look at the role that the church plays today, uh, uh, opposed to the role that the church played historically, and it, fit, it, it pales in comparison. Uh, today, in my opinion, uh, the church has become more business oriented. Uh, they're going more for building their congregations, large super churches, uh, large churches, they're moving. Out of, out of areas that they traditionally served to areas that are more prominent, uh, which in my mind gets away from what the church was intended for uh, in the beginning, at least the black church. That neighborhood church, and I'll never forget going down Puritan from, it was about, it was not Wyoming, from once around Wyoming all the way to Southfield, and I counted 60 churches. I mean, be it storefront store or a little front. bigger yeah. and so yeah. forth. And the neighborhoods right in front of the churches, it was trash, there were different things. I don't think that the neighborhood, you know, it seems like some of the churches, the people come in, they worship, and they leave. And what about that neighborhood surrounding the churches? Are they reaching out to the people in those communities? Well, I, you know, I, I have a different opinion. I understand you're, you're, you have your resounding yes, but I'm going to say, which church are you referring to? Are you talking about the church as a whole, uh, as, as a monolithic entity? Or are you talking about individual churches? Because I know individual churches that, that are making a difference in the communities they live in. Now, if you want to talk about all the churches, then I probably would agree to say, you know, the, the 60,000 churches in Detroit, um, that they are probably collectively failing the community that we all, we all live in. And I, I would, I would ag agree. In, but to really understand this point, you would have to really look at it from a theological standpoint as far as what is the mission of the church. And if, if we're talking about, um, if we're talking about the example of Christ, well, what was his agenda? Was it business? Was it to promote business? Was it to promote ownership? Or was it to promote education with regard to? Um, you know his father's will and I think that when you deviate too far to the left or right you're bound to fail because there was a there's an example there's a road map in the scriptures in those 66 books between Genesis and Revelation of how to behave and there's no there's nothing left to guesswork but I think that more times than not um, different personal agendas um, in the congregation trump mm -hmm. the actual mission that was laid forth. That's a point. Yeah. You know, That's and, a point. And, and so, yeah. And, and I agree with you. Holding the, holding the church accountable, definitely. The folks that actually attend that church and, you know, in that congregation have to hold the church accountable. But, but also, there's more onus put on the quote-unquote leaders of the church. There's more onus because once you step out and you put yourself in that position, you put yourself behind the pulpit or on the soapbox, there is more responsibility. And from that, from that, there's a responsibility from a congregational standpoint. Hold on just a second. Maybe someone wants to call in at 313-868-0342, 313-868-0351, or 868-4336. You could call in to get into our conversation. And the reason why I say that is that if, if we're ultimately looking at, at, at the church and its foundation, um, Christ, well, when Christ was on earth, he was harder on those religious leaders. 
those, those Sadducees, those Pharisees. He was harder on them because they had stepped into, yes, he was. I'm going to be it like in a classroom. Hey, me, me, me. Mm. Go ahead. Well, I noticed that a lot of religious leaders in a lot of churches are held like royalty. I mean, stone royalty. And some of them have anniversaries and the congregants bring things to them like, uh, I mean, congregants who can't even, some of them just barely feeding their families, but they make sure to give to this uh, reverend. I mean, if I were a reverend, or a I couldn't even, even see whatever, whatever. I, I, I can't even see asking. I, c I couldn't even see asking except or to support the church. And here's my other point. My other point is the church, the way the city of Detroit is, I think the church should do more missionary work. And missionaries get out into the community. I realize is that I do realize that a lot of churches have events, have have things. But a lot of people don't know about them if they don't go to that church. Am I correct? Yeah, you're you're correct. absolutely right. And, and lastly, I got I gotta say this, you need to go out into the community and the church doesn't do that. And that was my point when I said that the churches have moved on to other communities uh, as opposed to the ones that they originally set up and served. Uh, they find that the people that are in those original communities uh, aren't doing as well. They're not as prosperous. Uh, so they want to move elsewhere to uh, uh, build up a congregation that's more prosperous. But I also have Lucrative. a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's a business. It's yeah. a business. In the middle class and area. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, uh, higher class. But uh, I also have a problem when you have members of your congregation who are struggling, and yet the congregation uh, will present the pastor with a new car, and I mean an expensive car or a jet or uh, things of that nature. And that, to me, is where uh, the church has gotten away from its origins. And lastly, when they want to see your W-2 form and you got to give a certain percentage, they check you out and see if you've given your percentage to tithes. <laughs> I got issues. Miss Mary's on the phone. Miss Mary. Miss, hello? Hello. Yes? Yes, I'd like to make a comment about the black churches. Yes. For years they have failed, especially the youth in this city. Yeah, yeah. Because they're only open on Sundays for a few hours, and in the e there's no churches open in the evening with anything for kids to go to when they get home from school, and and this is one of the problems. And, and, and I think that, and I agree with you, Miss Miss Mary. And I think that a good barometer to judge these churches is their congregation. So. I would I would challenge the members to come out of the congregation and name me ten books of the Bible or uh, how to how to how to, how to find Matthew five twelve. Chris, and so, are you teaching I don't the know word any books of the Bible? But what I'm saying, Brenda, is is that's the that's the uh, original mission to teach God's word, and from there everything that's the foundation. That's but the foundation. What I'm saying is beyond that, and I have to say you can't beyond go beyond that. that I have so to quickly. Go I have to go beyond that, Chris. I have to go beyond that because they say get out. Like he told his apostles, get out into the community. And I think that's what Miss Mary's saying. Let's be of service to the community and everything. I went to church every day of my school career and I read the Bible. I can't pull you a, a scripture out. I can't do that. But I did learn the precepts of how to act and how to go be good and how to react to my community. But just because you know a scripture you know, number. But, but you're going extreme, Brenda. That's not what I said. What I said is, is that according to the scriptures, Christ left a model for us to follow. If he is the standard, obviously we won't meet that standard. But if he was the standard, well, what did he talk about? He talked about God's kingdom. Where is God's kingdom taught from? It's from the Bible. If well, you don't know the Bible, then you can't really teach about God's kingdom the way Christ taught about it. Also, a, par a part of the model uh, of Jesus' teachings was going out into the community. So exactly. Serving the community. And that's where, uh, as Miss Mary mentioned and, and, and we're, we've alluded to throughout, uh, that's one of the major failings of the black church. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. That's what I'm trying to say, Chris. No, I'm not I mean, disagreeing. Because I'm saying there's a I primary mean, objective. I knowing things, and I know what God said and everything, but I cannot pull a scripture number out. And that's, that's where I, I had I'm not, a difference with don't, you. Don't take offense a, a, a or anyone no, take offense to what, what, I, what I'm saying here. What I'm, 
What I'm saying is, is that, yes, Christ, he, he went out into, the, in, into his various cities and, 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 and areas around, but primarily he was known as a minister first. He was known as a minister of God's word first. And I don't think the, current, the, the churches today are primarily known as that. And I don't think that they're known as that. And because the barometer, just like a teacher, her barometer is her students and what they take from that class. I think that if you take the congregations as a whole, they're not taught well. That's, that's not what I'm getting from the churches now. I, oh, I, I think they are teaching. I think I believe they are teaching the Bible. But you have a lot of self-serving mm. um, churches and pastors out there and bishops and whatever else you want to call them that are asking for, you know, more of your credit card number versus going out and serving a community. I think that's more on top of. Versus going out and giving out scholarships for kids, aspiring kids going to college, versus going out and actually owning the property around the surrounding community so you can also service uh, senior citizens and um, the low-income folks. Is Miss Mary still on the line? Oh, oh Miss Mary? Yeah. I'm sorry, we got into this. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm really, really sorry. Um, I was just trying to say I agree with you full heartedly that the young people don't, don't necessarily if you don't know a scripture number you don't you don't you can talk to the uh, you're holding on the to whole, that. can I can I just finish I think the whole thing with the church is to teach us how to live and for us to help others know how to live and to live righteously and to respect honor their mother and father and respect their communities and um, Treat the children well and help the children. And I think people have fallen off. And if you don't belong to the church, a church, you're not going to know about these programs because the church doesn't get out there and tell the world about it. And, and it quite frankly, it's just gotten away from its tradition, period. Let's let the style let, of dress, let's let, gone let's out the let, door. Let's uh, yeah. let Mary talk. Let's let Ms. Per Mary, did you have anything else to say? Well, I just feel the church has failed young people more than anything else. Okay, and, and I, I agree, agree with, with you. And finally, I'd like to say, I, I, like to, I like to say that there's too much of I think. There's a scripture in the Bible in John 17, 3 that says, this means everlasting life. They're taking in knowledge of you, the only true God and who you sent forth, Christ Jesus. So with that in mind, it doesn't matter what I think. It does. It, no, it doesn't because it says, it says for clear, what you if you're think, a Christian. But what you think is going to take you to the next spot. I think that this it's is too valid much I think in the Wait church. A it's too much. I mean, it's valid thinking. I learned this <laughs> lesson, this scripture, and I think I should do this. I think I should follow God's teaching. At least, at least logical deduction from the teachings. Don, any last words on that one? Well, not being a religious man, I stepped away from religion some years ago, uh, and I like to use the term spiritual, spirituality, which is uh, a little bit different for me. And um, uh, it, it's, I had to step away from the church because of some things that I've disagreed. People have debated me for years about that, uh, but I just felt that it wasn't going in the direction that I wanted to go, but I still wanted to have that relationship with, uh, with God. Okay, uh, we have Yusef on the line. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I'm saying that before crack, our kids respected their parents and their grandparents. And now these are the crack children having crack grandbabies. And there's a huge gap of no respect because no one raised them at home. They open the refrigerator door and there's nothing in there with a light bulb. How can you love mommy and daddy? They sit on the couch and smoke. You have nothing to eat when you come in the house. Very good. So the kids have nowhere to go. And then we have the media labeling us as wel welfare queens and gangster guys. A label they choose to put on us and they play it around the world. They have it. We didn't work for a slice of the pie here in America. And they say that word entitlement. How dare they say that word entitlement? We've been here 246 years with no pay. And they sit and they want to bring the immigrants now and give them the money. All the blood in the United States is spent, our blood, and they dare to call me an immigrant. I'm not an immigrant. We ain't come here by Statue of Liberty. And that's why kids have no disrespect and no respect. Thank you. Thank you for calling in. Thank you so much. 
Okay, that was a lively discussion here, yeah. and I know Chris is saying what's wrong with me, but um, I, we could we could just debate that for four hours, Chris. Uh, we could debate, but we we only have an hour television show, and time is near because we really want to get to this next topic, and we want to know what you think, Chris. Uh, so the next topic is: Should college athletes of money-generating sports receive pay? And this is this strikes home personal to me being um, an athlete coming up and receiving uh, a scholarship to go to college to play a sport. Um, you know, overwhelmingly, I say yes. And um, firsthand, seeing the amount of money that is generated, not even from a, if I just took high school, how much, how filled our gyms were and how packed and everything was, but when you take it to another level, some of these big billion dollar, uh, the NCAA is a billion dollar institute, and I just think that they've had the benefit of free labor um, under the guise of education for a little bit long, and people now have recognized their worth, their value, contributing to the economic health of the university, and I think that it's time to compensate um, in some other way uh, outside of just uh, scholarship. I, I agree. There's been a tremendous exploitation of young athletes nowadays in, in college sports. But my question would be, which which schools are going to be paying? Are you referring to each school paying? Are you talking about NAACP? I mean, N N -N NCAA uh, yeah. paying out? Or are you talking about? Uh, I mean, wh who's going to be paying? Because some schools are smaller than others, and some that's how some schools get their revenue is from. College athletics. Don, you brought the question yeah. to the table. Do you have something to? Well, I guess it, it depends on how much that, uh, uh, to answer your question, Rob, uh, that money that that particular school is making from uh, revenue generating sports. And then uh, possibly the athletes can be paid accordingly. But anyone who knows me knows how I feel about this topic, which is why I brought it to the table. Uh, if you've seen me post on Facebook, if we've had discussions, you know that I feel that these athletes need to be paid. Uh, as to who's going to do the paying, the logistics of that has to be worked out. Uh, I know that the schools get millions of dollars. Uh, NCAA is a billion dollar uh, organization. College sports is a, a, a billion dollar uh, industry. And the one thing that stuck out with me was a story that was done a 30 for 30 about the Fab Five when oh. uh, someone like Chris Webber, and I hope I don't get in trouble for mentioning his name, but when he was with the Uni University of Michigan, he was walking around with uh, a, a reporter and he, they saw his jersey in the window knowing that the school made uh, millions of dollars off of his name and he couldn't afford to buy pizza. And along with that, they sold my son's jersey in uh, what's that name? That sporting goods place. There's one in, one in Troy. It's a franchise. They sold. My son went to University of Dayton. They sold his number. They would not put his name on it, but people were buying that number three. But the thing is, uh, they built. After my son left, they built an attachment to the arena, and they always say that's the house that Perryman built because the arena held about 11,000 and it was 11, it was standing room only for every single game. And he, he got nothing, you know, they did get an education and an education of course is priceless. And it would be okay if they insisted these athletes get their degrees, but a lot of times those athletes, you know, they don't get their degrees. Well, Brenda, th that part is a farce in my, yes. in my opinion. Well, I'm gonna tell you how it's not a farce. And I think they should be paid, don't get me wrong, but I'm gonna tell you how that is not a fire stop. There are so many athletes who don't finish their degrees, they go, they play overseas or wherever, mainly overseas, and you can make some good money overseas, but the life of an athlete is short as far as their um, playing days sometimes. If you don't learn if you don't get some kind of credentials behind your name, I know of a lot of athletes who didn't. They came home, they, they may have really gotten just two years worth of college credit, but they played four years and the university still allowed them to play. And they come home, they don't have a degree, they don't have a major and their money's running. And, well, and I'm gonna uh, intercede there and I agree with what you're saying, but here's my point about this being a farce. 
Uh, these coaches go into these communities, these neighborhoods, grabbing these athletes, knowing full well that these athletes probably aren't going to graduate, uh, especially your big name athletes. The, the big name athletes or most of your athletes, their dream is to make it to the pro sport that they're playing. Uh, they want to go in and get into college, do enough uh, to be able to get to, to jump to the next level, which is the pro league. So uh, I call it a farce because uh, all this is done in the name of, of education. Uh, getting a scholarship and what have you, but the coaches, coaches go into those communities knowing that the, the, if this kid isn't going to finish four years those of college. Those coaches talk so much bull crap. I've had 20 something coaches in my house, so I could tell you for sure. They talk crap. You have to go to the schools. Um, the reason why we selected that school, and that school was between that school and Michigan. And I remember when Michigan had us come up there and they sat us in the second row behind Chris Weber and all of them. And they, Ryan got to go into the dressing room, you know, during halftime with Chris and all of this stuff. And we knew them. And but I wanted him to get that degree. And the reason why we ended up choosing that particular university is because they graduated 100% of their athletes. I we had to kind of put that in. But when I saw the money that these schools make of yeah. these young boys, it's it's ludicrous. Mm -hmm. It is ludicrous. Yeah. And I agree and with that, Chris, I agree with all of you. And there there in my opinion there was a backdoor deal that was brokered between the NBA and the NCAA a couple of years ago because what you saw was the NBA had kind of undermined the NCAA and was grabbing these kids straight out of high school and the NCAA was missing out on players like LeBron James and, and Kevin Durant. And, and those type Kobe Bryants, and they were like, wait a minute, you taking off of my plate, buddy. It wasn't about how to, you know, get these kids in education. Yeah. And they, 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 they put it under the guise of, uh, well, we want to prepare them for the NBA. Well, there's other ways to prepare them for, well, for that. Well, here's the thing, and this is where people jumped into the game with the clearinghouse. Remember, they would just have these kids in high school. I think some high school coaches don't do uh, players right either yeah. because I've been asked to change grades and all this stuff for for coaches for students and so I think that you know it's it's terrible to see in high school that a young man has a whole entourage of people following him yeah, well, and, and then too if you look the sports that are dominated by uh, African Americans there is a mandatory um, collegiate career that's imposed and you have what do you mean by well you have baseball players that are that signed right out of high school you have tennis players that go go pro but I mean the two large sports which are basketball and football in this country you have to go to college or else the professionals won't you know essentially allow How you in the league you have to go to college for you have to go one year you that's have to go nothing. one listen one year these universities make billions of dollars mm -hmm. it's 25 percent of the of the of of the maximum amount of time. So mm -hmm. I don't think that that's nothing. Well, you what know, when you get to a college, when you get to a college, you're the best in your school. Yeah. Then you get to the college and you're playing with everybody else who was the best in their school. And you have to see, it's a good place sometimes to it, see where you measure I, up. I, 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 I played and I understand what I'm saying is if these universities are so worried about um, education, why aren't they doing, or the professional organizations are so worried about the education, why isn't it across the board? Why is it, why is it the focal point on those big money-making sports like basketball and football where you got to come to school, we've got to make a dime off of you? Well, I can tell you by football, you, you're not about to go from high school I understand to, it. to I, the NFL, no way. You got to develop your, you got to continue to develop physically. your body, body uh, physically over the next four years. To even get on that level, so I don't believe there's a high school player in, 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 in the nation to be able to handle himself on. The football I'll, I'll say this: if we look at basketball, which was my sport, the best players in the game um, over the last ten years came straight from high school, and I think that it wasn't a matter of whether they could perform. No, the best players. If you look at Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, Kevin Garnett, you know the list goes on and on the, of the players. Right. Tracy McGrady's. Those, those players. Right. And so the thing is, is that this wasn't a matter of physical maturity. Mm -hmm. I think that this was a business understanding that the NCAA recognized that they were losing a lot of revenue. And they talked to their big brother, the, the, the NBA, and said, hey, 
you you gouging is too much. At least give us at least give us a year. Well, let's let's call it what it is. Uh, you know, money making, uh, generating sports in college and sports in itself. It's, it's, it's today's plantation. Uh, folks get offended when I say that, That's but it true, is what though. it is. It's true. Um, and but our community also deserves a, a little of the blame in this, and that we need to make our our young men and young women understand that you got you, you should go to college. You should uh, graduate because there's more to it than just getting a degree. What people fail to realize is once you go to a college and you get your degree and you become an alumni, you can then turn around and start uh, becoming a pipeline for other family members uh -huh. uh, to start coming to, to that particular college. So you can start your cousins, your, eventually your children, your grandchildren, and you start a tradition of people that can start going to that college and getting their degree. People who have never bounced a basketball or thrown a football. Uh, so that's being missed out upon. But it, it is what it is. It's uh, uh, making billions of dollars. The athletes get nothing for it. A lot of them go to the pro. Most of them go to the pros and wash out. They end up being on the street or poor right. or whatever the case may be. Uh, that was my case in point earlier, yeah. by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, you're right. You're I have a absolutely huge problem with right. it. Yeah, I agree. I think they should be paid. I really do. And if it, if you get an extra lunch in the lunch line, because they give you a stipend for your food, if you get an extra piece of chicken, they can violate you on that. Seriously, because that almost happened to my son. He got, somebody else gave him their lunch. And they he just about got in trouble. That was his freshman year. Hmm. I mean, this was for food, for people who... I mean, that kid is six foot seven. He eats more than the average bear. And I think it's so unfair. The guys have to follow a strict set of rules. I think the university deserves to give them more than housing, more than books. I think they should get a little salary. Well, I think a, there's a, a effort being made. There's a student that goes to uh, Northwestern, Northwestern yeah. University. Uh, they're looking at forming a union. I don't know how successful that's going to be, but I think everybody has been waiting for someone to take that first step, and I'm hoping that that's the first step uh, in trying to straighten out this fiasco. And, and it needs to be fair across the board, because if that happened, it definitely didn't happen with me. And going to a smaller university, we got to eat whatever we want. We're treated like kings down there, as a matter of fact. Uh, as many times as we want to, and hey, just to, to get our strength well, that's up. That's just a normal rock treatment. <laughs> but but it must be like a, a larger tiered uh, universities then. I, I think that uh, some type of salary attached, if you're really looking at education, it may just keep kids in school longer, you know, um, because a lot of these kids are acting out of necessity, or at least perceived necessity. They feel that I've got to go and take care of, of my family, whatever little bit um, will help at this point. And so if you gave them something, Maybe, maybe they'll stay because they've got enough right now. Well, I think it goes back to what Don was saying. It has to start at home. Yeah. It really has to start at home and with the family, and the family giving that child realistic expectations of. I have seen parents bring all these signs to the game, next NBA player, the next this and that. I have had young men tell me, well, when I grow up, I plan to go to the NBA. No other alternative no other alternative i think it so much starts right at the home don't you agree? i mean i mean holistically yeah. the home is that's probably our primary issue today <laughs> everywhere yeah, yeah, across the board across the board with each topic starting at the home and that's that's it it's unfortunate but, but some of these parents uh, uh, especially some of the single uh, parent homes where these athletes come from start looking at that kid as being a possible money train. Oh, so, yes, they so do. So they, they go along with the program themselves. Um, yeah. And it's sad, but that's just the way it is. And, and these universities, um, they're masters at this. And so some of these single parents, they're, you know, they don't know what they're going up against. Well, I, they went up against me, man, because uh, <laughs> at Michigan, the gentleman who was accused of giving Chris them money, they sat him right next to me. And he gave me my, his card and he said, see, I help the players out. And if they need, me, and if you need me and your son needs me, hey, give me a call because I'll help you out. Well, I'm not stupid. Also, I've had coaches, because I am an author, go to places where my book was on sale to see how I looked. And they would um, call me and say, oh, Ryan has a good looking mother. I mean, how dare you? But they thought I'd be Sucker Bill. But there are a lot of parents who aren't 
maybe don't read up on it, and they're so desperate for that child to and make And their it. circumstances could be different. Overwhelming number, too. And their circumstances oh, I'm could, sure be, they, could, be, they, could be different. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, you know, these universities are well-oiled okay. machines, and uh, they know what they're going to do, and they're going to accomplish their agenda well, here's, one way or the other. Well, here's the other last piece. I think there should be workshopping for parents of athletes. It should start in the ninth grade uh, or, or in middle school where you talk to these parents. Tell them, I, I try to tell as many parents as possible what to expect and uh, it's time to go and we didn't get through all our subjects. And Don, thank you so much for stirring the pot with us. My Chris, pleasure. I'll fight you after the show. And um, <laughs> Rob, thank you so much. She's going to work on my grammar. Oh, uh, don't even say that. Uh, what did you say? Uh, Everybody, <laughs> join us again next week. And next week is Valentine's Day. Of course, you could go to Amazon online and get my book, Mood Swings and Net Magic Carpet Rides. It would be a beautiful book for your loved one, male or female. And thanks to Michelle, my producer. And we will see you next week.